And now we leave prehistory behind and move into history. The Neolithic Age saw hugely important advances, including the advent of agriculture, the domestication of animals, and the invention of pottery. Then, around 3200 BCE, civilization took another leap forward. It took this leap in four separate river valleys. We'll leave the Indus and Yellow River civilizations for a later unit. In this unit, we're going to hang out in Mesopotamia, or the land between two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates, and then in the Nile Valley. Although we're going to lump these two civilizations, or civilization centers really, together in a unit, their differences are really more fascinating than their similarities. Art provides intriguing clues to these differences and great opportunities for comparative analysis. We'll do more of that when we get to Egypt and we can look at Near East, ancient Near Eastern and Egyptian works together. But first, let's watch a video clip about what may have been the world's first true city, Uruk, in ancient Sumer, now part of modern-day Iraq. So what makes cities possible? Why do cities make such a difference to history and especially the history of art? I'm going to take those questions in order. So, what makes cities possible? As the video indicated, agriculture made cities possible. There has to be enough surplus food to feed people who are not engaged in hunting, gathering, or other forms of food production. Only settled agricultural production enables this much food to be produced. Rivers watered fields and made large-scale agriculture possible, but taming these rivers also tended to require some kind of civil engineering. Organizing large-scale communal endeavors, such as major irrigation projects, in turn demanded a level of administrative complexity beyond that that was required by early Neolithic settlements. This means that new structures of government power and authority evolved. The leaders, in turn, used art to portray and to strengthen their rule. And supporting these new centralized authorities was organized religion. And that, too, was a powerful impetus for art. There's a real danger that art history is going to become a dizzying parade of images that you try to cram into your already overcrowded hard drive. So what I want to do starting today is to begin helping you organize these works mentally by introducing general themes that we're going to follow throughout the course. In this unit, we're going to focus especially on three themes, power and authority, sacred spaces, and artistic conventions that reinforce political authority and power and reinforce religious belief. When we turn to Egypt in a couple of days, we're going to discover a civilization that is dominated by the Nile's extremely dependable cycle. The river first floods and then recedes from the valley, leaving a straight strip of fertile soil in its wake. Not surprisingly, maybe, this civilization developed a religion that on the one hand worshipped a regular cycle of nature, but at the same time celebrated an unchanging, linear nature of life. The Tigris and Euphrates were nowhere nearly as cooperative as the Nile. The spring floods they produced were unpredictable. They often wiped out everything in their path. The cooperative engineering feats that tamed the river helped build an urban civilization, but the river was never entirely tamed. The fertile river valley also attracted constant invasion from nomadic tribes in the hills. Remember, this is down in a, in a flat river valley. Uh, there was no Sahara Desert to create a barrier against invaders. Why grow crops when you can just steal them? Maybe because of the continued uncertainty of their lives, the Sumerians did not develop a reassuring religion. They believed that the dead person survived in the form of a ghost who lived in the underworld. An obligation of surviving relatives was to make funerary offerings of food, drink, and oil. Without these offerings, uh, or worse, without proper burial, the ghost would be forced to wander around and might decide to haunt the living. Conditions the underworld, by the way, weren't particularly good either. The dead uh, lived in utter darkness, feeding on dust and scraps. So let's watch another video clip, this time about the Sumerian religion. Note that you should gain some insight into the function that is the use of two of our required works, the statues of Voda figures from the square temple at Ishnuna, shown here, and the white temple and ziggurat of Uruk. So for all its extraordinary accomplishments, the invention of the wheel, the invention of writing, the creation of the first large-scale engineering projects and urban administrative complexes, 
Sumeria was not a civilization filled with hope or confidence. The Sumerian religion and art instead reflected a civilization buffeted by rivers that constantly flooded and changed boundaries, city-states that were constantly at war, repeated invasions from surrounding less civilized but more warlike people. So this photo shows us what archaeologists found in Sumerian ziggurats, or temples at the top of Sumerian ziggurats. Not images of kings or even gods, but images of worshippers who are imploring gods. At no other time in the history of the ancient Near East has non-royal sculpture survived in such abundance. So what did these dolls represent and why use dolls to approach the gods? I'm kind of deliberately using the word dolls to shock you. What they represented were the offerings that the people who designated these as their representatives had made to the gods, usually food, but probably other kinds of goods. They are also surrogates for the people who could not themselves enter into the presence of Sumeria's scary gods. Uh, these surrogates could also stay in the temple, imploring favor constantly, while the individuals whom they represented had to go about their daily lives. So we've talked about the content and function of this work and established, I hope, something of a context. Let's turn to form. What do you notice about the form of these figures, what they look like? Well, what strikes me most and probably struck you most are those wide open eyes, fearful, alert, unsleeping. There are no sign of eyelids here. The figures radiate anxiety in the face of God's fate and an unpleasant afterlife. They can't sleep since only eternal vigilance will placate the gods. In other words, this is symbolic or conceptual rather than optical art. The figures do not show much facial variation. There's not really much personality here. They tend to assume the same stance, left foot forward, hands clasped right over left. The shapes are very simple and geometric, basically cones and cylinders. Are the bodies proportional? No, the heads are disproportionately large, reflecting the belief that this is where the soul resides. Are the figures all the same size? Actually, it's hard to tell from the College Board's required image, which is why I included this photo of a grouping of these statues. Here we see that they vary considerably in size, probably reflecting the status and wealth of the petitioners, maybe the size of the offerings. We'll see this term, hierarchy of scale, hieratic, all the time, so start learning it. Art very often portrays the importance with scale. Important figures are bigger, less important figures are smaller. You should recognize this panel from the Palette of Narmer. The pharaoh is larger than the official. The official is larger than the laborers carrying pharaonic symbols. Hierarchy of scale is not limited to Near Eastern art. Here's a Mayan example. Note the relative size of the king. And here is a Christian example from the Middle Ages. Christ in the center is much larger than the surrounding figures. So where were these statues found? They were found mostly in the ruins of temples, and the temple stood at the center of a Sumerian city perched atop a stepped ziggurat. The surrounding countryside, you have to remember, was very flat, so the ziggurat served as a kind of man-made mountain leading to the heavens. Sumerian cosmology described the world as a disk of land which was surrounded by a saltwater ocean and then a freshwater lake. A world mountain formed an axis mundi, M-U-N-D-I, a term for world center or cosmic center, central axis. We'll encounter this again when we get to Buddhism. And this axis mundi joined the three layers. So the temple, the axis mundi of the city, was a meeting place between gods and men. The plan of the temple was rectangular with the corners pointing in cardinal directions, north, south, east, west, to symbolize the four rivers which flow from the mountains to the four world regions, but this orientation also let the temple roof serve as an observatory for charting the heavens and using the information to maintain a calendar. We've already seen astronomical orientation at Stonehenge. We will continue to see it, for example, in the pyramids. A ziggurat had a core of mud brick and then an exterior of baked mud brick. It had no internal chamber, so there wasn't anything inside this mountain. It was just mud, and it was usually square or rectangular. There was an exterior triple stairway or a spiral ramp that led to the top of the ziggurat where a temple was located. So why build a temple from mud brick instead of stone? 
Actually, the answer to that one is pretty straightforward. Mesopotamia did not have much stone. The Egyptian architecture that we'll study in a few days has survived much better than Mesopotamian ziggurats because mud washes away. Placing the temple on a man-made mountain also made practical sense. Why? Well, remember those raging rivers? The ziggurat was a high place on which the priests could escape rising water that annually inundated the lowlands and sometimes flooded for hundreds of miles. The ziggurats were also easy to defend. Since the shrine was accessible only by way of the three stairways, a small number of guards could prevent non-priests from spying in the rituals at the shrine or, of course, invading the ziggurat. The rituals, you'll recall, uh, included cooking sacrificial food and burning the carcasses of sacrificial animals. Remember, these gods were hungry all the time. Each ziggurat was part of a temple complex that included a courtyard, storage rooms, bathrooms, living quarters around which the city was built. So what political point does the ziggurat make? Well, this religious and administrative mountain signaled that the gods ruled the city and the, the rulers had the ear of the gods, that they climbed to the top and were in communication with the gods. Note that the separation of church and state is non-existent in this and most of the societies we're going to study until we get to much more recent times. So this is probably the most famous ziggurat. Its remains were excavated in the 1920s and 30s by Sir Leonard Woolley. Uh, Saddam Hussein, uh, the dictator of Iraq, partly reconstructed the ziggurat in the 1980s as a monument to the glory of his regime, which, of course, the United States <laughs> Army toppled. Note that the temple staircases follow a bent axis plan. The doors of the long axis were the entry point for the gods. They weren't used by people. The doors of the shorter axis were the entry point for man. So anyone entering uh, would have to make several turns. And, you know, I looked, and I really didn't find a truly satisfactory explanation for this feature, which is one of the differences between Mesopotamian and Egyptian temples. Uh, Egyptian architecture tends to be very linear. But maybe it reflects the uncertainty of the Mesopotamian religion. The gods were approached fearfully and indirectly. As we'll see, the pharaoh had much more secure and direct access to the gods. Indeed, he was a god, or on his way to becoming an even greater god. Uh, this I thought was interesting. It's a photo of the original excavation of the ziggurat at Ur. So I've been talking specifically about the ziggurat and its relationship to Sumerian culture. Let's zoom out for a moment and think about the second theme for this unit and a hugely important theme for the course, which is the way sacred spaces both reflect and reinforce the religious beliefs of a culture. We're going to be looking at a lot of religious buildings in this course, and for that matter, a lot of religions. But whatever the religion, sacred spaces tend to have certain elements in common. It's good to keep these in mind when you're writing about a sacred space. Many, though not all, allow for only exclusive access, sometimes by priests, sometimes by the king, sometimes by both. For example, many mosques had special areas set apart for the leaders. In Catholic churches, only the priest could approach the altar and the apse. While some traditions, such as some forms of Protestantism, reject the decoration of churches, most religions embellish and fill their sacred spaces with art and precious materials. Sacred spaces are almost always the location of specific rituals and ceremonies. And finally, sacred spaces are often located in places with a special history, uh, the location of a miracle, for example, or in this case, the center of the city. So we see all these features in a Mesopotamian ziggurat and temple. Again, I'm showing you the ziggurat of Ur, which is not a required work, but it gives a better sense of how the white temple and similar structures would actually have looked. So we see the small cella or house of the gods, only space for a few priests, and of course, the statue that was the cult statue of the god. This was quite literally the house of the god. We will see this again in Egyptian temples. We will see this again in Greek temples. The votive statues were found in waiting rooms outside the cella. Only the priests could enter the cella. Again, we see exclusivity. It's harder to see the material wealth and decorative features from the ruins, although it would have been a great deal of work to build such a huge mountain out of mud brick. But we know from archaeological finds that the original ziggurats and temples were covered with colorful glazed brick and decorative tiles. And of course, they were filled with all the offerings to the gods. We saw some of the ceremonies on the videos. Of course, this is archaeological guesses and some guesses based on writing. 
By the way, the temples were not only used as special feeding places for the gods. They were also feeding places for the people. They were used for food storage and public administration. So in times of famine, the political authorities could dole out food. And of course, this further reinforced their authority and further associated them with the gods. Finally, the ziggurat and temple, as I just said, stood at the center of the city, yet reached toward the heavens. Again, this location reinforced the link between political and spiritual authority. So after that brief digression into sacred spaces, a theme to which we will return often, I want to look at more elements of power and political authority in the ancient Near East, in Mesopotamia. So Mesopotamia was rich in soil and water and agricultural produce, but not metal, stone, or other valuable goods. To acquire these goods, the Mesopotamians, the Sumerians, needed to engage in trade. And this seems to have been the context in which the reason why writing developed. On the left, you see an example of an early cuneiform text. It's made by pressing a stylus, kind of writing instrument, into clay tablets, which then dried. Most of the cuneiform texts we have are actually legal or financial documents uh, that record transaction. They're secured with seals that identified who was conducting the transaction. Uh, the cylinder seals on the right are not required works, but they do offer an example of the difference between sunken relief or intaglio and bas-relief, or a slightly raised surface. You're going to be reading about that. Cylinder seals were carved in sunken relief and then rolled over wet clay to create a bas-relief uh, imprint. The third required work in this unit offers strong evidence of the Sumerians' dependence on trade. Note that the precious materials used to make the standard of Ur come from far beyond Sumer. Well, I know it must seem as if I assign every Khan Academy video, but actually we saved this one for showing in class, partly because it includes such a good review of Mesopotamian culture and mostly because I want you all to be sure to see the close-ups of this work. So let's watch and then discuss. Now that you've watched the video, what was the function of this work? That's a trick question. We don't know. Uh, we know it probably wasn't a military standard, which was Woolley's guess. Maybe it was a sound box for music. Maybe it was a box to hold treasures. We just don't know. We do know it was found in an elaborate burial site. It was an object of great significance. It used precious and scarce materials that had to be brought from far distances. So another reality of Sumerian life was, as I've already mentioned, oops, I need to go on to the war side, constant warfare between Sumerian city-states and war against invaders from the hills. By the way, this work offers evidence of a very important technological innovation that transformed warfare. Any guesses? Chariots, which enabled fighters to move faster and to fire from a platform. It was really like the tank transformed warfare during World War II. So let's finish the Khan Academy video. The third theme I want to discuss briefly today, uh, one that we've already explored, is the way cultures adopt certain stylistic conventions to convey a message, a message about power and authority, a message about religious beliefs, or uh, to tell a story more efficiently. The hierarchy of scale is obvious. The king is larger than the guests at the banquet. Uh, his head, as the video pointed out, is actually breaking out of the frame, and the guests are larger than the servants. We talked about the problem of narrative when we looked at works depicting Judith and Holofernes. Storytelling that glorified the rulers and honored the gods was central to this culture, and the standard of Ur displays some of the stylistic techniques used to make a narrative clear to the viewer. The artist employed continuous narrative. He chose not to portray either the battle or the possibly post-battle celebratory banquet with just one image. Instead, we see a series of images, possibly though not definitely in chronological order. Uh, from And to separate the events and the social classes both, the artist employs registers or bands of narrative. We still use n n registers to tell stories, right? As the Khan Academy video, video noted, we also see a stylist convention for portraying people. The faces are in profile, yet they have a frontal front-facing eye. The soldiers are squared, facing forward, but the legs are shown in profile, so is the body. And the feet are all moving lockstep in a single direction. Notice that the animals are similarly composite, but there's one difference. What is it? The animals' bodies are shown entirely in profile, although all four legs appear, as they might not if truly optical profile were employed, because one leg might be in front of the other. So why did the artist choose this perspective? 
Well, it was probably socially required. Originality was not yet considered uh, an important artistic objective. But as we noted during the discussion of prehistoric art, this perspective also conveys a great deal of information, if not always realism. Now, the sculpture on the right is not one of your required works, but it does offer a good segue into the culture that conquered the Sumerians and some clues about what happened. We told you to stop reading before you got to Akkad, so I'm asking you to guess now, not to relate what you've already read. Just looking at these two works, the Sumerian votive figure on the left and the Akkadian ruler's head on the right, what changes might the art represent in the political and religious culture? Well, we know that the sculpture on the right is a king. The Sumerian votive figures exhibit hierarchy of scale, but we don't see anyone signaled out as a ruler. There's no indication that one of them is a king. Leaders of the city-state hoped to show that they were blessed by the gods, and they sought the gods' blessing, but again, they were not gods. What about this fellow? Maybe he's on his way to being a god? Note, too, that this face is much more individualized. The personality of the king seems to matter. It's more naturalistic as well, although we still see a highly stylized beard and hairdo. And finally, this is a cast metal sculpture. That means it's additive, not subtractive. Metal technology is improving, which will have huge implications for civilization. This is the first work you will encounter in tonight's homework, and the only work that Ms. Jacobs and I added to your required works list. We added it because this work signals some very important developments in Near Eastern art. Uh, if you have time, brainstorm for a minute or two about what you're seeing, what is similar to the art you have already seen, and what seems to be new here. Well, we still see a kind of registers with the low, lowliest people on the bottom, we see hierarchical scale. Naram Sin is much larger than his soldiers or his enemies. But what's different? Well, the king is wearing horns. You remember what that signifies? It's often a sign of divinity. The claim that the king is himself a god is new, but we're going to see it again. The registers aren't flat. They're diagonal, emphasizing a march toward heaven. This is an artistic innovation. And finally, we see some evidence of landscape, practically for the first time. We'll take up here in our next class.